Uh, let's show the picture that, that we have in the show, slideshow. Pam Kenner uh, shared this at our worship committee meeting on Monday night. These are folks in Haiti uh, this Sunday after the hurricane. Their church is gone, their chairs are gone, many of their homes are gone, and many of their people are gone. And they gathered on Sunday morning to worship God and to seek the face of God. And I, I've had that on my mind since, uh, since Monday night, hearing about it. It's a, a powerful image and a reminder that what we do in this place is of the utmost importance in our lives as followers of Jesus. So let's keep these folks in our prayers and uh, let's pray together as we go to our gospel lesson. Lord, we are reminded of our brothers and sisters in Haiti, in South Carolina, North Carolina, other places around our own country and places all over the world. Brothers and sisters who are suffering in ways that few of us can imagine. We lift them into your presence and we join our voices to theirs, singing your praise for your goodness and love, for how you care for us through these tragedies. And we pray for them, that they may find you close by their side every moment. Lord, we ask that you would send your Holy Spirit afresh as we turn our hearts now to your words. We want to hear from you. We've come here to be with you and to hear from you. We trust that we will. You are always faithful to speak when we pause to listen. We thank you, Lord. We love you, and we pray all of this in the strong name of Jesus. And we say together, Amen. Our gospel lesson is from Luke chapter 18, verses 1 through 8. Let us hear the word of God. Then Jesus told them a parable about their need to pray always and not to lose heart. He said, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor had respect for people. In that city there was a widow who kept coming to him and saying, Grant me justice against my opponent. For a while he refused, but later he said to himself, Though I have no fear of God and no respect for anyone, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice so that she may not wear me out by continually coming. And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long in helping them? I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them. And yet, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Every time I hear this parable of the unjust judge, I can't help but think of two, uh, two just and good judges that I know. I have breakfast with one uh, every Thursday morning, and I, I don't know many people who can do what he does. I don't know many people who have the ability to hear case after case after case of of custody issues, of divorces, of, of juvenile delinquency and drug offenses and DUI and thievery and just general sorriness across the board. He hears it all the time. And, and then he is still able to listen to people with his heart beyond the crime, beyond whatever was done. His sentencing always held in tension the ability to believe the best about someone's future and the need to still punish the crime that had been committed. He always, he always used these moments of crisis in the life of a criminal to, uh, to try and lift him or her out of the mud of life. He was always trying to see something better for their future than whatever they could imagine for themselves. 
I say he was always doing that because he did not get reelected this last go round. Partially because folks painted him as soft on crime. He wasn't soft on crime. He was just following Jesus, trying to seek true justice for everyone involved, not just uh, vengeance on a criminal. Then there, then there was this uh, federal judge in another church I served. He recently retired after, I think, 35 years on the bench. And while I was one of his pastors, he heard some of the most difficult, gruesome, sadistic cases, stuff that would make anybody's skin crawl. It just would shake you to the core to hear the stories that he had to, had to hear. The Sunday paper was always full of the gory details and uh, what happened in court, updates, what the judge was doing. And, and every Sunday morning during those trials, he would be right in the sanctuary in his place, three rows from the front, about right there where Jack and Nidra are sitting in this other church. We'd stand to sing the opening hymn, and I would, uh, I would watch him. About halfway through the second verse, he would close his eyes and tilt his head back and just be, just be in worship, just be in the presence of God. Sometimes tears would come down his face, and sometimes you could see, you could physically see the burden that he carried to bring justice to the least of these in our society. I always wondered what he was praying, what he was thinking in those moments. And finally one day I got up the courage. You have to get up courage to talk to a federal judge, no matter how nice they are. <laughs> I finally got up the courage and I said, what is it that you are praying that you're thinking in worship? He said, he said well, I don't really know. I don't really know. I just, I just need God to hold me close. I need to know that he cares. And I need to know that he walks with me through this horrible journey that I'm on. My friends exemplify what, what God told Moses a judge should be. From Deuteronomy we hear the judge should be impartial and fair should hear the small and the great alike, status, wealth, power, none of that should matter for the good judge, according to Deuteronomy. Then Second Chronicles says, says, let the reverence of the Lord be upon you. The call of the judge is to declare God's judgment and to establish shalom, the peace of God among God's people. The peace of God that brings wholeness to all parties. The, both the one who was wronged and the one who did the wrong. It is hard work and it requires much prayer, personal sacrifice, and especially trust in God. That's how judges were supposed to be. But that's not how the judge in this parable was, is it? He did not fear God. He did not respect or care about people. And he wasn't about to waste his time hearing the case of this widow. The widow. The one person that God names a thousand times in a thousand different scriptures. Care for the widows and orphans as people of faith we, the people of God, have an absolute obligation to care for the folks for whom no one else is caring. And what did he do about that? He just blew that off. He just ignored that. He didn't care anything about that. He wasn't going to waste his time. It was just easier to put it off and ignore this woman. She would die eventually. You know, starvation, sickness, Sooner rather than later, those kinds of things come quickly on the poor, on the homeless. And besides, she couldn't afford a good lawyer anyway. But he underestimated the persistence of a good woman, didn't he? She knows what is right, and she will not rest until she gets it. She plays the long game. 
She goes day after day after day after day until finally he relents. Not, not out of reverence for God or respect for her, but just because she has worn him down. She has worn him down with her continual presence in his courtroom. It makes me think of Mr. Buddy Teddington from Munford, Tennessee. When I was at the Munford Church, the Stevens over here, my, well, your brother knows Buddy Teddington. He was about 80 years old, and we went through this time at the church where we realized that everybody in the church had a key to everything. And so it, that's happened here before, too. It happens in every church about, I say, about once every three years we go through key crisis mode. All the locks were changed, new keys were created, and no one except staff and, and a couple of key lay people were given keys to the church. Mr. Buddy had always had a key for 80 years. Apparently, he was born with a key to the church. And so he came every time he was at the church. He came, preacher, I need a key. Y'all change the locks. I don't have a key. I need a key. I've got to get in here. I said, what time do you get here to open your Sunday school class? He said, I get here about 730. I said, well, guess what? I open all of the doors and the classrooms at 7 a.m. every Sunday morning. See, you don't need a key. You can come in, and it's already open for you. I'll even turn the light on for you. No, that wasn't good enough. I need a key. I've got to have a key. Every week we talked about this. I've got to have a key. You've got to give me a key to the church. I don't have a key. I've always had a key. Why did you take my key away? It just went on and on and on and on. He was so persistent. And one Sunday morning he got there about 7.05. Oh, boy. He got there about 7.05. I was coming out of the back part of the building. I had already unlocked his room, and I had already unlocked the main door. He caught me in the parking lot, and he started in on it. I was not having a good day. Somebody had left a bunch of mess in the bathroom, and I had to clean that up. I was upset already. And he said, when are you going to give me a key, preacher? And I just went berserk. I was 26 years old, screaming at an 80-year-old, Mr. Buddy, you are not getting a key. No, you will not ever have a key. As long as I'm here, you don't need a key. There's no reason for you to have a key. Just quit talking about that key. If you don't shut up about the key, I'm going to lose my mind. I just went on and on and on. And I finally stopped, and he just grinned real big. And he said, I love a preacher with a little spunk. <laughs> I just walked away. Just walked away. I didn't want the front page story of the newspaper to be a church member killed with a key in the parking lot. At the... You know what I did Monday morning? I made him a key. <laughs> and I took it to his house. And I said, here is a key. Persistence. <laughs> Persistence. It works. Luke is is painting us a picture of persistence in prayer. We see the widow as a model for what it means to, to continually come before the Lord with our, our deepest needs and our most heartfelt desires. But, but this is about more than just persistence in prayer, isn't it? Jesus says, Listen to what the unjust judge says. What does the unjust judge say? He says, because this widow keeps bothering me, because she keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice so that she may not wear me out. Now we get to this deeper layer of meaning in this thing. How many of us have felt like the widow how many of us still feel like the widow? We feel like God is the unjust judge in some moments. We've been asking for justice. We've been pleading for life. We've been praying for forgiveness, asking for hope, for healing. We've been seeking life in the midst of the death of death, and it, it just feels like we're having to worry God to death to get any kind of response at all. Or worse yet, it is as if our prayers aren't even being heard. The pain that comes from that is absolutely unbearable for we who believe. And so we come to church sometimes and we sit in the pew 
angry at him. And we would never admit or say aloud, but we say in our hearts sometimes, Lord, I'm going to sit in this pew week after week after week after week until you answer me, until you return my child to me, until you redeem my mean old husband, until you save my broken marriage, until you set me free from addiction, until you give me a better job. I'm going to sit right here and worry you to death about it. I think Jesus would say to us, yes, that's beautiful. Be angry at God. That's fine. But remember, remember, the unjust judge is a counterpoint. It's a counterpoint to our loving God who is filled with compassion and hope. Remember what Jesus said, and will not God grant justice to his children who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long in helping them? No, he will quickly grant justice to them. You see, you see, Jesus is helping us to see the true nature of God, especially in our prayers. God is not at all like the unjust judge in this parable. God is the opposite. God anxiously awaits, even anticipates our prayers. God begins answering them even before they are formed in our hearts. We pray with persistence for our own benefit to remind us, to connect us with the truth of God's persistent faithfulness toward us. You see, life Life, unfortunately, has gifted us with a dense fog <laughs> that keeps us sometimes from seeing God's love as the all-encompassing reality that it truly is. We struggle. We see in that mirror dimly, as Paul said. We cannot imagine. We cannot imagine that God would really love us like this. And so we, we invent a thousand scenarios in our minds if only, if only I pray enough, God will hear me. If only I'm good enough, God will save me. If only if I can put the right words together with the right formula, God will answer my prayer. Sometimes we turn God into a sadistic sugar daddy <laughs> whose favor must be earned, whose ear must be bought with blood and sweat and tears. The natural consequence of this image of God is, is frustration and fear, anger and resentment toward God for not answering our prayer. Even while God is whispering, whispering persistently in our ears, but I love you with my whole being. I have heard every word you've ever uttered. I have caught every tear. You have ever cried, and I have shared every hurt you have ever known. Of course, I'm answering your prayers. You just can't see it yet. You just can't see it yet. Persistence in prayer is about us learning to see God's persistent faithfulness and love toward us until that day when. The veil is lifted and we can see that God has been with us all along the way. Last week, um, Shannon and I uh, felt our little girl kick for the first time. We were lying in the bed and uh, actually, and I'm not making this up, we were saying our prayers. And Shannon started, all she got out was, Dear Lord. And the baby just went crazy. She was flipping and flopping and carrying on. And I put my hand there and I could, I could feel her moving. And then, and then she, she kicked really hard. And I felt her foot in my hand. I could feel the toes, I think. And everything got real all of a sudden. You know the first thought I had? The very first thought that I had 
I wonder what she needs to flourish. I wonder what she needs. She needs a healthy and a happy mama. She needs a daddy who loves her. She needs a home that is full of joy and peace. She needs to know about Jesus just as we all do so that her eyes can soon be opened on the goodness and love of God so that she will never not know that God loves her. She needs a church family like this one in which to grow up into her own faith. She needs so many things. And you know what? She's not going to have to ask me even one time for any of that stuff that matters most. She's not even here yet, and I am already working on it. So it is with God and you. So it is with God who loves us completely who hears our prayers even before we ask them whether we know it or not. Y'all know this song that Ann's playing? Let's sing. Let's sing the chorus. Listen to your children pray. Lord, send your spirit stand with me and let's pray together oh Lord we thank you so much that you hear our prayers each and every day that you are so faithful to us and that you really do love us this much it is hard for us to believe help our unbelief and hold us up in your love and your grace and help us to be the people you have called us to be Not because we're afraid of you, not because we're worried about messing up, but just because we want to please you with our whole lives because you love us like this. Lord, we open this chancel rail to all those who might need to come and pray today. Help them feel free and comfortable to be down in this place and to receive your grace and your love as we sing. And Lord, if there's anyone here who's not ever had the chance to say yes to Jesus, to put his faith, to put her faith in the one who saves us by his grace and love and help them feel free to come and start that journey today as we become family together. We love you, Lord, with all of our heart and we sing together. Amen.